I'll get started. For what? <laughs> Yeah, you can go ahead and send yours. I'm going to wheel mine over out of the way. Hey guys, this is Jason of Archaics.com. I promised you guys that I would invite Ben Davidson to the channel. Many of you, many of you blew up my emails and shut down my Google account behind this man. So I brought him to you. I'm going to give him the floor. But first, I need to let you, I need to do my audio check. Tell me in the chat how we're, how we're sounding. Hey, Ben, won't you introduce yourself? Hi, this is Ben Davidson from Suspicious Observers and Space Weather News. Yes, we're going to get into it. Let's see this audio. Audio should people in the chat always tell me every every video how good the audio is or how bad it is. It'll it'll start showing up in a second. All right, Ruby speaks. Thank you, guys. The crossover the crossover is fantastic. And what I mean by by that is you know archaics only focuses on the historical record. We do not go beyond fifty two thirty nine B C. All the dates, stelae, the monuments, the ancient texts, chronographical material. This is what Archaic specializes in. This is the material we produce. Now, Ben, if 
from suspicious observers is bringing data and data sets from an entirely different perspective. And this is where things get interesting. It wasn't me that noticed this. You guys brought this to my attention. So I had to listen to about 17 of his presentations one day while I was in my wood shop. And it resulted in, in this collaboration here. Ben has come to many of the same conclusions from a totally different vantage point. And what I tell you guys all the time, for three years I've been telling you, if something is going to occur, it will always be seen from multiple different mathematical vantage points. So this is what we're going to do. Some of these crossovers are very interesting. I have this list, and I'm going to let Ben take off on whatever he wants to go into. But, th but some of the th crossover, the things that he's mentioned on his channel, is like the elite preparing underground fallout facilities. Why are they preparing these underground facilities? Skyquakes, skyquakes actually have a subterranean origin. This is something I've told you guys as well from totally different data sets. Now, I'm not a scientist, guys, so this is very surprising of this crossover. Um, we have this lesser cycle of 6,000 years that I have been heavily focused on. Uh, the sun triggering lightning, flux tube uh, blasts, these discharges uh, from the sky. Uh, these are things Ben talks about. And even projected dates for pole shift, total lithospheric displacement type event around the 2040 to 2050 mark. That's very intriguing because this is, you guys already know, I don't even have to say it. So that I am a critic of, Ham, of Grand Hamcock is known across YouTube. You guys have seen my videos on that. Uh, this is where where, where uh, we have some crossover. And this may, may be for entirely different reasons. Um, oh, and the flash freezing of entire ecosystems showing absolute evidence of, of, of what happened in the past. Okay, Ben Davidson is a catastrophist, and so am I, for totally different reasons. So Ben, why don't you take the floor, introduce, introduce us to your work, what exactly you're doing, you're very qualified to say the things you say. I, I would never take that from you. Uh, your channel is very successful and your presentations are spot on. You, you stick to the facts and, and if, a, if a video needs to be nine minutes, it's nine minutes. It needs to be uh, 22 minutes, it's 22 minutes. You, you're, you're like me, you don't fill them with filler and I like that. And the other thing about your channel that really impresses me is that you are very focused on the positive and, and that message comes out in many of your presentations just like archaics we're always trying to tell people to break free and, and maintain that positivity so uh, introduce my listeners to your work who you are what your channel represents man and the amazing findings that you've been coming across in the past 15 years absolutely uh well as as you mentioned and thank you for that wonderful introduction i'm ben davidson from the suspicious observers channel and believe me i've noticed the crossover as well um your names come up several and you know several doesn't even begin to describe it how many times that somebody's mentioned you in our comment section essentially from a um from a very high level perspective there have been articles out about what the sun can do about earth's magnetic field changing and they're very superficial and i wanted to dive deeper into it and it turns out that whether you're looking at earth science, geophysics, whether you're looking at sun science, heliophysics, whether you're looking at the entire solar system, because the entire solar system is actually changing right now. We are looking at a galactic cause, galactic astrophysics, whether you're looking from an archaeological perspective, there's corroboration across all of these different disciplines. Uh, and even when you get into mythology, religious texts, other things like that, they're all telling the same story, whether it's somebody with a Bible in their hand or somebody doing calculus about galactic astrophysics, it's all telling the same story that there is this cycle. Something happens to the planet. Um, folks like Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson, they, they've kind of, they're they kind of on the path to, to, to seeing some of these things, but there's some very key things that are being missed that is causing them to really not fully understand that this is a predictable cycle. The evidence of this happening in the past is quite robust and it's in the process of gearing up to happen once again um probably in just a couple decades here and it, it really is the kind of thing where it requires people to be aware of what's going on to take proactive steps to make sure that 
They're ready for something like this. And one of those things is to make sure that their minds are in the right place. You know, some of this stuff is scary, but fear is not the right reaction. Fear is a thief of time and focus and energy, not to mention it it messes with your own body field. And that's actually a real thing as well. Um, and so literally everything you were talking about, pole shift is coming. The sun is playing a major role in this making sure that our head is in the right positive space, standing in the light, so to speak. All of these things are critically important to understand right now um, because even though the, the zenith, the peak of the disaster might be a couple decades away, you've not been living under a rock, you know that things are already getting kind of rocky. So let's go ahead and jump into this, shall we? Hey, hey. so concerning Graham Hancock, it's a, I don't want to focus on him. I just I – just, I did listen to one of your presentations, and I believe the variance here is that he introduces an element of catastrophism, but what he thinks is uh, responsible for all the evidence of this ancient, basically a total collapse of an ancient infrastructure, he, he, he believes in an impact version, and the impact version really doesn't necessarily promote the cyclical version. Am I correct in assessing that? Absolutely correct. And... There's a way to get impactors from the sun. And when, when you're looking at an impactor, yes, there is evidence that we had an you know impactors in some of these past events that can account for all the evidence. And one of the things that I will say I know about as well as anybody is the history of catastrophism. You know, it really wasn't until the last 60 to 70 years that it really sort of started to be looked at negatively in the scientific community. It was the biggest field of science for quite some time. And there was a man about a hundred years ago named Hibben who made the charge to the field. You guys have a lot of great ideas, but we're all over the place. We need to explain all the evidence that keeps happening cycle after cycle. And when you do that, you realize you need more than just a comet or an asteroid. You need something that can happen over and over again, something that can affect the entire planet to a relatively equal degree, not just in the area that is impacted. You need to be able to explain very extreme isotopes in the data. You need to be able to ex uh, explain continental level tsunamis and a magnetic shift of the planet. And when you're looking at something like that, you really need to be looking at the sun because it's the only thing that can actually impact the entire planet in that way. And as we're seeing now with, with modern science, it's already beginning to change and affect the entire solar system. Yes, uh, there's no doubt about that. This, uh, um, <clears throat> So we have a phenomenon that's documented on YouTube, and, you, and we have to take these things with a grain of salt. One of my... One of my my core teachings in archaics is that we have to question all optics because this is the age of Photoshop and we can't take old pictures for granted. This is why I'm so big on my own channel with showing these very original uh, pictures from my own personal library. I got, I got a library of a lot of very old books from the 1800s and I show those on my channel. And modern pictures... It's just really, it's really hard. Optics or something else. So on YouTube, we see these videos about sky quakes. And some of them you can tell are very, very authentic, while others may not be so. But the, int the, the interesting thing about sky quakes is that in the historical record, this seems to be a phenomenon that has occurred in blue skies and, and been recorded in different texts over the period of centuries. And what exactly do you think, what is your idea that this, this rumbling in the sky that some people claim reverberates the ground as well, what do you think this is? So I've got two, two ways that you could probably do this that fit with the scientific reality. Um, one of them would be that they are purely subterranean origin. There are a lot of things happening inside of the earth, as many as are happening up here on the ground where we live. And these are from the core to the magma to where the mantle actually meets the crust. And these vibrations um, can actually be scalar and can actually have a, an impact further away than they do closer to it. So even though here on the ground, we are closer technically to that subterranean activity than the sky is above our heads. Um, 
it can really uh, impact the way that Earth's upper atmosphere and especially what they call the ionosphere, which is this basically layer of charged particles that sits on top of the atmosphere, how that actually behaves. Now, I really do like that explanation, but I'm always the guy who, who likes to say, well, here's option A and here's option B. And if there's an option C, give that as well. Earth's magnetic field has already begun to change. Earth's magnetic poles are shifting. The actual strength of the magnetic field that protects our planet is weakening. And with that, we are noticing weak spots that pop up here and there. It's not a constant homogeneous field. And with the weak spots, it's very possible that the solar wind from the sun, which would be most impactful on you know the sunlit side of the day, right in the middle of the day, could actually be breaking through and actually reverberating the top of the atmosphere. Kind of like if you held a piece of paper just at the very edge of it and you whipped it back and forth, the paper would kind of make that you know, rumbling sound. But just imagine that in terms of an electric sheet that's on the top of the atmosphere. And so what's interesting is whether it's one of those, both of those, or some kind of combination, they both have the same origin. And that is the fact that our planet is changing magnetically in a very fundamental way. So let's talk about, oh, uh, okay, this, this magnetic variance that, that has been deviating since the, what, 1860s from uh, really scientifically noticed. It. And it started appearing in the scientific journals, of the like astrophysical journals. It started appearing in the Royal, Astron the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, I, ha I, have a lot of the, I have a lot of old books, David, that, I mean, Ben, that go into detail about what was being observed in the skies during those periods. And, and it was noted in the, by the late 1800s that the, uh, magnetic north was deviating at an increased rate from true north. So the question remains, how far is this magnetic variance going to, to go? What is the disparity between true north and magnetic north and, the di and this growing distance before we actually see something lithospheric? Consider, you know, true north being directly up. The actual mag the magnetic north kind of meanders around and goes all around these different places, but it does so very slowly. Throughout history, we think it's been about a kilometer or two a decade, and so it meanders very slowly. But in 1859, which happens to be the last time the sun hit us with a super flare. Carrington event, right. Correct. Probably not a coincidence. It started racing really quickly, and it was – in Canada, and now it started racing back very, very quickly. Instead of going one to two kilometers per decade, we're now clicking at about 30 to 50 kilometers every year. And we've noticed that it has accelerating marks every couple of decades. It's getting faster and faster. It has finally blown past true north and is now going south towards Siberia. Now, what's interesting is when you think about magnetic poles, you think of a north and a south you know, anything like that, but they're not staying on opposite sides of the planet. The South Pole is moving as well, and they're actually moving towards a collision course just off the coast of India in the Bay of Bengal, which is the northeast portion of the Indian Ocean. And I would think that it would be sometime around when they actually make it there that we would actually begin to see some of the major lithospheric changes. Now, when that's going to be, that's that's kind of the tough part. We do have data that shows, and this is one of the, the, the best papers of the last couple of years, that when the magnetic field shifts into a really high gear, its shift will be 100 times faster than it is right now. Right, so, like it's going to hit a tipping point. It's going to hit a tipping point is basically what it's talking about. A point right. of no return where it just becomes at an accelerated rate. Right, right. Yeah. And it's hard to tell when that's going to be. Um, it's hard to tell when those accelerations are going to occur. It seems that in the past, some of the times when it has had those accelerations have been when the sun hits us pretty good again. Other times it has been during a cyclical event known as a geomagnetic jerk, which happens every couple of years. There's a, a glitch in the core, the core rotation and how it interacts with the mantle. And so 
We know that we're entering sunspot maximum right now. We actually have a geomagnetic jerk that should be happening any day now. And then there'll be another one in about four years. There'll be another sunspot maximum in about 10 years. And so during some of these events that are coming, we really could see the major acceleration that really begins to take things off. And at that point, I mean, even before the main peak of the disaster, flying airplanes will become very dangerous, not only due to increased radiation, but because GPS is not going to be as reliable Um there will be phenomenal electric currents that begin to flow through the atmosphere and the ground. Uh, power systems will become incredibly unreliable. And these are going to start to really impact the kinds of infrastructure and, um, you know, other systems, communication. Uh, what about navig- the oxygen content? I mean, wouldn't wouldn't the aircraft buoyancy be a factor if if we're having a we a, a, a weakening of the magnetic field, what it would do to the basically the the density of oxygen in our atmosphere, what keeps airs and you know airplanes in the sky? What right, it? it would probably have some effect. Um, I would say that it has a better chance to affect the high precision needed with um, you know with flight paths than it does necessarily here on the ground the good let's go with our first bit of good news this is a cyclical event that's happened many and many times and at no point have we had a hypoxic event a a low oxygen event to the point where everything on the surface dies so there's a very good chance we're still going to be able to breathe here but absolutely um these things should be affecting how planes are able to to work and how the low earth orbiting satellites are able to keep their their position which critically important for again all of those infrastructure and and, and critical systems like communication navigation transportation other things like that Power. okay okay uh one thing i wanted to uh, point out is uh most of my listeners, I have a lot of new listeners, so I'm going to reiterate this point. We were talking about the underworld, under, underground quakes. Um, I know um, it's very hard. I'm an Occam's razor type of guy. I'm going to I'm going to take into the consideration the origin of phenomena from a local area more than I will somewhere far away. Like I'll give you an example. I know you're familiar with a lot of researchers who put out these fantastic theories about everything that's happening to earth right now is because of some type of galactic core meltdown or, or things that are so many light years away. I don't see how they could really, really affect us in such a, a local area. I am, I am more on board that everything going on on earth would be a result of activity from the sun. It would be our largest influence. So you and I are in perfect agreement about that. But when it comes to the underworld, do you, do you realize that we actually, the habitable zone of humans we're only living in about 2% of the actual habitable zone. We have a lot of untapped real estate. We can we can build cities and pancake them on top of each other and go down to to uh, subterranean subterranean sweet water water tables. I mean there's to me it seems like we should have an infrastructure intact in the underworld already. I believe we do. I mean my next video Ben, after this one I'm, my next video is nothing but underground cities. I'm doing a whole exposition on underground cities from the ancient world all the way till today showing actual photographs so to me it seems that many civilizations have prepared for this we're not the only ones what's your thoughts on that i think that's probably true um one doesn't even have to to look very hard to see that the vast majority of the civilizations that have survived some of these past ones had subterranean shelters now some of those are very peripheral you know they're just like dug into caves and other things like that um i think that there's probably been a lot more activity on this planet in in the history of it than we are told Uh, i believe past civilizations got to where we were technologically if not much much further um and it really speaks to how big this disaster is that they either got sent back to zero or got completely wiped away I think that there's probably areas underground that, well, first of all, there's definitely habitable areas underground. Um, Humans could survive an enormous range of, of, of conditions that are currently not on the surface. Um, And to be honest, I think that there are probably even throughout history, more underground activities than 
even exist today because every time we get one of these cycles, the crust shifts, there's major volcanic events, there's a global level earthquake, some of them probably get destroyed. So yeah, there's a lot of evidence of what there is now. And throughout the history of Earth, there's probably even more. Um, yeah. Oh, we've uncovered a lot, video. Ben. We have, we have you video. would not believe the amount of the archaeological findings that have have already confirmed confirm this exact scenario that we're talking about. But you're right. You make a good point. For everything that we have found, for the 58 to 59 subterranean cities that have already been excavated and explored in Cappadocia, the ones in the one in the Grand Canyon, which the scientific world over and over tried to claim was a hoax. In my next video, I'm going to be showing where the, the Smithsonian lied and it was published that they lied. They claim that these guys never existed. They never worked for the uh, uh, Smithsonian and then come to find out somebody applied my method, which is to go back to the original hardcover books of the 1800s and look up the Smithsonian reports and these two scientists did live and they actually worked for the Smithsonian for 20 years to cover mm. up to cover up the actual discovery of an underground complex that was in the Grand Canyon they had to fire these two scientists and then tell the world that they had never worked for the Smithsonian. But that's just that's a subject for another video, but it just goes to show you what you're talking about. For everything that we have found, there's probably 98 to 99% of these facilities that are all over the world that have been buried in volcanic resurfacing, sub, you know, uh, liquefaction, liquefaction, uh, volcanic, you know, all kinds of events, earthquakes can collapse things, tsunamis can de can deposit whole new soil materials mudslides yeah they're gone we don't have access to them anymore so that, that's a really good point so i, I want to talk about this uh okay the potential of a pre-polar shift carrington event the what is the possibility of a collapse in our electrical grid our total infrastructure due to events that are just leading up to an actual pole shift and the pole shift hasn't uh the the tipping point hasn't been reached we're just gradually getting into it closer and closer and closer because i understand it's a process it's it's described as a process even in the book of noah and in the book of the watchers very ancient texts that were found in the dead sea scrolls they specifically say that before the coming of the great flood noah looked up at the skies and he saw that the stars were wandering and, and that that the whole dome vault they call it a vault the whole vault of the heavens was slowly shifting right before a cataclysm occurred it was like a temp like a temporary pole shift just enough to destabilize the world and everything went back to normal after the destruction so what do you see as a possibility in this amazing infrastructure that we have built that is absolutely so fragile are there phenomena that would attend a pre-pole shift period that could collapse our infrastructure Absolutely. And before I get into some de detail about that, I'm really glad you brought that up. One of my favorite uh, one of my favorite lines is how uh, one of the chapters of the book of Enoch begins. And this isn't exactly what it says, but it says something like, and Noah saw that the world turned over and knew its destruction was near. Yes, uh, yes. There, there are there are there are fragments of the book of Enoch that have been found in the uh, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. I am I am citing the exact same passage you're referring to now. Uh, okay. From yeah, the fragments of the Book of Noah, uh, the uh, the Genesis Apocryphon, uh, the Book of Giants, the Book of the Watchers. These were all independent texts that we know of today as the Book of Book of Enoch, but they weren't originally the Book of Enoch. They were independent texts. Right. So, getting back to your actual question, the real, the only reason we are able to have an electrified way of life right now is because of Earth's magnetic field protecting us. It it buffers these blasts from the sun. It, you know, protects our atmosphere and it reduces how vulnerable we are here at the ground to electrical surges. We have already started to see because Earth's magnetic field is weakening, it's changing, that smaller and smaller events from the sun are able to have greater and greater impacts. And this is this data is available in terms of effects on satellites, effects on voltage detected in power grids. It's very evident in some of the aurora there have been so many in, you know in terms of the 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 northern lights the aurora borealis there have been so many sightings of pink aurora in just the last two years 
Now, here's the thing. Pink Aurora is not hurt, not unheard of, but it only happened with major, major solar storms that we would get over the last several decades. The problem is we're not getting any major solar storms right now. Everything has been moderate to even minor events. And the fact that we are seeing the Earth the aurora, the lights above our heads react in the same way that they used to react to only the most severe storms tells us that weakening magnetic field is letting more in and letting it penetrate deeper. And so we are already starting to see this. Now, the reason this is important in relation to your question is because as the poles are shifting, you know, it's not just that the poles are shifting, the magnetic field is weakening and it's weakening faster and faster and faster. We will get to a point where, and this will have to be before everything snaps, we'll get to a point when the magnetic field is so weak that something from the sun will send an electric surge through the atmosphere mm -hmm. and the crust that will simply destroy all the power grids. And even though that could be 10, 15 years, I mean, that could be next week, you know, which would be, you know, 20 years, 25 years before the actual pole shift. At that point, all prepping is over. All commun all the internet's gone, TV's gone, electricity's gone. There's no water from the tap. There's no air conditioning, no heating. There's nothing at the stores. ATMs are shut down. Your phone doesn't work. And wow. that's almost certainly going to happen before the zenith of the event. We have we have multiple events coming up to us here in this in this ongoing catastrophe. Oh, I, I'm, I certainly agree. It's uh, uh, Ben. Um, I know you haven't had time to do a real deep dive, but I have like 350 charts, and of those charts, I got about 60 of them, and I show with immense source materials all my data points and data sets showing from the historical record that we have these small epicycles that are within this larger framework of, of this grand lesser cycle that you talk about on your channel, which is 6,000 years. Now, I understand that there's this, this other solar cycle uh, um, is 12,000 years, but that's far beyond anything Archaics entertains because my platform is specifically covering only the historical record, what humans have recorded. But when it comes to the 6,000 year lesser cycle that you, that you talk about, you have absolute confirmation in the archaeological, historical, traditional, mythological records, textual records, things we can verify that that 6,000-year cycle does exist, and it was known in ancient times. There are, there are historic writers that even mention that there is this grand cataclysmic episode of this a new heavens and a new earth being created every 6,000 years. So I found that very interesting when I saw when I was listening. I was in my wood shop one day, and I decided, okay, well, I need to go ahead and check on check out Sus suspicious observers. So I just put it on your playlist, and I hit hit. So I just all day long, I just listened to the uh, your presentations. So by the time I was done, I was like 17, 18 videos in, and uh, that's when I had emailed you and, and invited you onto the channel. So I, I find that six thousand the six thousand uh, year deal very interesting, but my output is very specific because uh, I use I use I use all different types of systems because it, it is a fundamental teaching on my channel that if anything is going to occur it will be seen from multiple different mathematical vantage oh. points and 2040 is this key date from multiple different species of analysis of this next pole shift event which lines up in the book of revelation with the sixth seal when the when the sky rolls like a scroll there's a worldwide earthquake people hide in the caves and the rocks the sun darkens the moon turns blood red rocks fall from the sky and this is an event that has been predicted in prophecy from ancient ancient religious texts all over the world simply because prophecies are merely scientific observations of past events. And this is what I'm telling my viewers a lot. This is why I was really impressed with what I was seeing from your channel, to see these things also elucidated from a totally different perspective. So what are your thoughts on the timing of this coming pole shift in proportion to the data sets that you have personally analyzed and seen? What do you think the next trajectory of events are? The trajectory we are on now, can you give us a rough chronology of the next maybe 30 years? Right. So 2040 is definitely within my danger zone timeline. Um, this would be mostly based on the math of how fast Earth is changing. Um, and I was, you know, with that, 
you never really know when's the acceleration. Um, I, I leave some room for error. And so I had said late 2030s all the way through the 2040s would be sort of my, my scary window. So, you know, maybe call it 2037 to 2049 would be my scary window. So, of course, 2040 is right there within that. It's really interesting because I started this from a geophysics and a sun physics perspective. And when I got to the point when I was trying to figure out, okay, well, what is this major solar blast going to look like from the physics and what we know about Nova astronomy throughout the cosmos? The sun is literally going to darken. There's going to be this shell accumulation in the upper atmosphere of the sun, and then that's going to get blasted off. And I realized, okay, wait a minute. That's going to be your three days of darkness. That's your solar flash. That shell that gets blasted off, that can turn into impactors. It can push asteroids out of their current paths and, and into the earth. And so I was like, okay, well, what else can religion, archaeology, mythology tell me? And when we look at some of those stories, I went back to the physics side of things and I'm like, wait a minute, that's also going to happen. So many of, I mean, it's amazing how catastrophism is the link that lets us know religion and science are not, it's not, you have to pick one. They're the same thing. It's just how literally do you read the religion versus can you understand what it would have been like 6,000 years ago for somebody with the equivalent of a third or fourth grade education today to be describing what essentially would look like magic. And if you can take that mindset, you start to realize they are literally just doing their best to describe things that we can today describe and predict and observe on a path to coming to fruition right now with, with science, with which is, you know, seriously advanced this is also a common theme on my channel i'm always explaining that when we dissect these traditions and myths we have to do so by keeping it in mind that the the frames of reference to a post cataclysmic society would have been more primitive so we have to remove that dressing to get down to the core fundamentals of what they were trying to communicate to us because that is exactly what happens after a cataclysm and the collapse of an infrastructure it's the survivors who have basically lost their literacy lost their infrastructure they're the ones telling the tale and that's what's preserved in the mythological record and this is why these things seem so childish to us. But when we remove that childishness, we're, we're left with core scientific facts about what happened in different periods of Earth history. And this is what I find fascinating. This is what Archaics is about. Fantastic. I, I couldn't agree more. That was a perfect way to say it. And so I guess getting back to your question about the chronology, I think at some point the sun is going to hit us with something and take out global power. Um, depending on whether that's this sunspot cycle or another one in the 2030s, you know, a lot of the world could be gone before the sky rolls like a scroll and the earth turns over. Without electricity, it's simply a fact that a lot of humans aren't going to make it. And one might even say the majority of humans aren't going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I can I can agree with the 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 collapse of the electrical infrastructure. I can agree with that, which would stop everything. It would stop groceries from appearing in the stores. It would stop all the transportation. It would take about six months to a year for, for individual communities to basically come up with, it would be the barter system all over again. Uh, uh, this is something that, that, that most people aren't aware of, that commerce was run by barter long before any currencies were actually exchanged. So right. this is a, the barter system is fantastic and I can see that coming back. But the reason I agree so strongly that the infrastructure will collapse before the actual pole shift is because the nature of the eschatological references concerning the major battles and wars of the last days before the day of the Lord, before this apocalypse begins to unfold. The apocalypse unfolds right after the pole shift. The pole shift introduces apocalypse. Prior to that, it's all preparatory. This is what the seven seals are. The seven seals in the Revelation, very specific. This is not a part of the apocalypse. These are seven seals that must be removed from a scroll. And only once the seventh 
seal is removed after this pole shift, which is the sixth seal, the scroll can be opened and the unveiling begins. And the unveiling is cataclysmic for people who are not ready for it. And it's an, and it's an actual revelation of all kinds of new spiritual uh, knowledge and material for those who are willing to receive it. It's two different realities unfolding at the exact same time after this pole shift. I agree that the infrastructure is going to collapse because the nature of the prophecies that are recorded leading up to this pole shift describe armies that are fighting with swords and shields and all kinds of things again. And this is exactly what you would find. If no one's manufacturing bullets, within three years, the next war will be fought with shields and spears. So it's just the way it is. It's uh, You can have all the guns in the world, but if nobody's manufacturing gunpowder and no one's no one's actually has presses go, going full steam to produce bullets, all the armament in the world will Will, will do you no good. So, yeah, we have major we have major war that's going to interrupt that's going to erupt in the Middle East. It's just prior to the pole shift, and uh, that that what what's being described in that war doesn't really make sense if the if they're using technological. It's a different, you know, today's Western warfare is very different than the warfare of ancient times. But the warfare of ancient times is going to come back, and if we if we if we I would use like the standard as in the days of Noah concerning the last days. Well, in the days of Noah, that's how they fought too, on horseback with more primitive weapons. So I take all these all these little things into consideration. So uh, I may be wrong, but in being wrong, that assessment still supports the fact that that I agree with you that yeah, I mean, we got we have a we have a, a we have a really dark time coming even before the pole shift takes off. I agree completely, and I'm glad you used the phrase in the days of Noah. And that goes back to something else you said, that you can see this coming no matter what your vector in life is. For me, it's science, and I can look at the physics and see what's happening. You know, marry theory, process, and modern observations – if you are just a Bible thumper, and that like that's that's your linear focus. You have to look at the world today and say this entire planet is starting to look like Sodom and Gomorrah. People's behavior, their degeneracy, the attack on family values, the attack on loyalty and honor and respect and other things like that. What they're doing to our children, the the onset of so many things that are either you know, close to satanic or directly satanic or related to Baphomet. Um, this is literally becoming the world right now. And, you know, if you are a psychologist, you can see certain upticks in how in, in certain behavioral issues people are having, uh, certain problems that are becoming really prevalent in society. If you look at what the global leaders are doing to us, a lot of that is described as 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 things that are supposed to happen now and so really no matter which vector of life you are in there is a way for you to if you're paying attention if you have the eyes to see that those stories you heard as a kid are starting to come true right now there's no there's no doubt there's absolutely no doubt so uh one phenomena that i, I want to discuss is um i read in some older books that Archaeologists were, were going through the Hittite ruins in Anatolia. This is ter modern-day Turkey and Cappadocia. And they noticed something very unusual that was also seen in the American Southwest and also seen in buried architecture found in Death Valley. They noticed that these buildings had been vitrified. And yet the surrounding ground, uh, it looked like it was untouched. And this same vitrification had been noticed in the Sahara Desert in certain locations where, where it looks like a, a, it's like a giant lightning blast from the sky just turn whole areas of the desert into this beautiful green glass. I believe they call it tectites. So, so um, <coughs> excuse me. Is this a solar phenomenon? Because in the historical record, we do have actual dates for when this type of discharge activity melted 
structures of, of human manufacture in the year 1899 BC in, in the Near East, is principally around Babylon and, and Nineveh. Then we have it again in 1229 BC during the Trojan War, but not on the Trojan theater of war. It was in the exact same year, but it was in Hittite Anatolia. And then again in 713 BC, we have a biblical event where according to the apocalypse of Barak, it was an electrical discharge from, from God and that it vaporized 185,000 Assyrian soldiers that were wearing iron and bronze armor and weapons. You know, is this, is this something different? Am I, am I mistaken? Or could this be some type of solar phenomenon? These no, massive that's exactly, electrical discharge. That's exactly what it is. And I, I don't know if you saw me smiling when you started telling that story. I knew where you were going with this one. Um, so there are about 150 to 200 year major solar cycles. There's a bigger one at 1,000 years, an even bigger one at 3,000 years, and an even bigger one at 6,000 years. Any one of these, if they hit the earth the right way, they're going to create a thunderbolt from the gods, basically an arc discharge down from the sky. Um, if you can picture the earth here, our magnetic fields wrap around in these arcs. They look like okay. they look like seas. And yes, there's the ones that come out of the poles and wrap all the way to the other poles, but there's also interior shells upon shells. It's like when, two Taurus fields, like two toroidal, toroidal fields. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I got it. And when you get too much energy, so let's just say my head is the earth and here's and here's one of the those fields, okay? And the sun is over there. Okay. Basically, when the sun surges electricity, surges that plasma and it hits this shell, it does two things. It compresses it and it increases the amount of charge and electric current that's going through it. So you basically have a smaller area but vastly greater charge density to the point where it it's going to take the path of least resistance, which is no longer along the flow. It is straight down to the conductive earth. And I mean, we're talking a lightning bolt that could be, you know, anywhere from a hundred times bigger than the greatest lightning bolt humans have seen recently to it's as wide as a city. So basically these, these Hittite structures, uh, some of them were, were built with with uh, um, I don't know. It's like it's like um, I forgot what kind of was it dolerite, blue dolerite, uh, rhyolite. They're they're it's like heavy metals that are in that are that are prevalent in this stone. And then uh, the incident in the Bible could it have been that they were just an antenna. One hundred eighty five thousand people were an antenna. Uh, if you have a camp full of full of guys that are surrounded by metal. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's a pretty good. Uh, it's the same reason you don't go out on the golf course when there's a lightning storm. You put that golf club up in the air, you're mm. you're asking to get hit. You okay. you march a bunch of people out into the middle of a desert or in the middle of anywhere, really. Yeah. And you put a bunch of metal on them. They're asking to get hit if they're there at the wrong time. And the sun has just got it. Been a blast our way. It's begging okay. for it. Okay. I'm going to go into another to topic now that I don't. I don't know. I don't have enough experience on your channel to know if you cover this topic, so it might be totally new. It is. It's a. Uh, we're gonna. I want. I want your opinion on after a pole shift. Now, I I am promoting the idea based off a lot of material that I've come from books in the 1920s, scientific books that I've shown on my channel where these scientists are talking about a, a vapor canopy world. Like, a, like Venus has this vapor canopy and are talking about one being replicated on Earth in ancient times and that the collapse of this vapor canopy is actually the origin of the Great Flood stories. Now, what, what the, the creation of this vapor can be. Can you envision a scenario where after the pole shift, volcanism all over the world, this outgassing and this ash being shoved into the atmosphere from hundreds of volcanoes in a short period of time, creating a layer at the same time that this cosmic dust blankets the outside, uh, the, the upper mesosphere, while the Absolutely. lower meso while the lower mesosphere takes all the volcanic ash. Because according to these scientific books that I cite on my channel, uh, there's four of them. One published in the 20s, one in the 30s, one in the 50s, one in the 80s. 
they're claiming that that's all it takes to create a vapor canopy that can last for centuries and actually block out block out a lot of solar light and yet create a very high humid environment that's like tropical warm warmth where reptiles and amphibians can grow to astonishing sizes and all that. What is this scientifically viable in your opinion? Yes, there's another thing. So you mentioned the volcanoes. You mentioned the cosmic material coming from the sun blasting it out. There's one more thing. You know, everything in space is connected electrically. We are all in an electric field of the solar wind, which means we form a circuit. And when you see that, you see things begin to interact before they actually touch. When the sun fires even the modern day minor solar events at us, as these things are approaching, O3, ozone, begins to get pushed out of the atmosphere almost like a shield the earth throws up at this blast from the sun that's oxygen being released hydrogen coming from the sun so in addition to the two things you mentioned there's going to be an even greater amount of top top layer oxygen released an even greater amount of solar hydrogen coming in connecting hitting interacting electromagnetically there's going to be a lot of water a lot so, of water made. so what you're describing to me is if we're going to have an influx of a hydrogen like you're saying then wouldn't this create manifold more nitrogen which which is which would explain this these tropical lush periods we have in the histo- we have in the historical record about three different periods that humans document when the this 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 canopy appeared and it lasted for lasted for a long time before it faded away and during these canopy periods animals grew to huge sizes and so, especially reptiles and amphibians so well, and, and also trees and plants and all that but so actually what we what we what we actually entertaining here is a new heavens and a new earth virtually after a destructive pole shift that's basically what we're talking about absolutely and uh to a point you just made i i'm sure if you've been doing this research you know that the saharan desert goes green every once in a while the greenest the greenest period they have on any record was just over 5,900 years, or just over 5,900 years ago. So 6,000 years ago was the greenest of the green Sahara. That was you just nailed. You just nailed the date 3895 BC. This, and I know you're not familiar with this, but my, but my listeners are, I, I have over a hundred charts that show 3895 BC was a total infrastructure collapse of a prior civilization who had survived a devastation that was so horrific that they believed that they were the only survivors. And it's the origin of the Adam and Eve story. They called themselves the Adamu, and they believed that that they were living in a new heavens and a new earth because they built their civilization on a former ocean bed. And everything, the topography of the entire world had changed. I have I have documented a lot of this, but for you to say over 59 centuries, you just nailed 3895 BC, which is one of the core dates in the Archaics research for the last time that this epic cataclysm occurred. That's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Yeah, I, it's... When I found the evidence of the of the phenomenal volcanic activity and the greenest of the green Saharan, and the, the actual scientific term for that is a tropical hydroclimate shift. When I found evidence of the tropical hydroclimate shift and the massive volcanoes at 6,000 years ago, that's when I went and started looking for Earth's magnetic changes back then. And I found some paleo intensity evidence to suggest it existed. And I've been calling it the NOAA event. Just this last week, they discovered evidence of a magnetic shift in volcanic records from that same time, right on the border of China and North Korea. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to, because technically these are where you name these after the area where they're found. So maybe we'll call this uh, China or dprk event um but whatever it was we now have evidence of um of a magnetic excursion a magnetic shift major volcanic activity and an unfathomable tropical hydroclimate event six thousand years ago 
approximately. Hey, can you hours. can you explain? I'm familiar with magnetite and how it's recorded and, and, and how it's measured and as rock is cooling. Can you give a little, give my listeners a little a short dissertation on how these scientists determine these magnetic variances in the, in these rocks? Yeah, essentially, um, if they can pretty well understand when some when rock went from liquid to cooling as a solid form. They can tell where the magnetic, they notice, wait a minute, the deeper, further away portions all had the North Pole pointing this way. And then the very last ones had the North Pole pointing the exact opposite way. And so um, it really tells them that there was a magnetic shift right at the time when this volcano was going off. And we know from those other studies that we just mentioned a few minutes ago, there were all those other things happening uh, 5,900, 6,000 years ago as well. Okay. Can you still hear me or see me? I can still see you. There was a moment where I couldn't hear you, but I can hear you again now. Okay. All right, cool. Long long as short glitch, we're back on. Okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, there was a there was an interruption on this side. I just can't see you on my screen anymore, right here. This uh this screen went out. Or was that screen ever on? No, don't worry about Okay, cool. We're back on. You have I got my audio and you can see me. We're good. It's okay. I'm not too pretty. Nobody needs to see me. <laughs> yeah. It would be nice if they could see the flag. Right. But, so, no. oh, yeah, I'm, I'm a patriot. I got some patriot videos out, too. I'm I'm 100% hardcore patriot. I'm a, well, when I say patriot, I'm really just anti-globalist. Let's see. All right, cool. We're all, we're all good. We're all good. So, this, um, yeah, that's very interesting. This 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 whole blanketing deal. So really, like, uh, there are times there are times when the scientific community had documented massive amounts of cosmic dust. One of those times was 1902, and if you look at the scientific reports from 1902, you'll find that as early as February, and then all the way to October, the entire year, they were documenting this blanketing of this red dust. And in areas of high humidity, it rained on. On, on whole on whole geographical areas uh, as red mud. So talking to you, I'm beginning to wonder now if this red dust is coming from the sun, if, the, if this isn't a, a solar phenomenon. Well, so um, I don't know if it's coming from the sun, but we do know that dust is increasing in the solar system. Uh, because I like to have a bunch of different options, there is a galactic physics option where something should happen to the solar system every so many years, um, and it should bring with it a lot of dust. Um, the increase in dust is one of the things that's going to help to create that shell on the sun eventually that it blasts off. Um, but yeah, this is something that modern scientists have been seeing more and more as well from the interplanetary space you know between earth and venus between earth and mars to the actual top highest parts of the solar atmosphere the atmosphere of the sun they're noticing the amount of dust is increasing and there's a very good chance that this is one of that's, the that's progress very, that's very interesting yeah that is very interesting because it's it's many of the cataclysmic episodes that I have documented, that is a common denominator, that during those episodes, there was a fantastic amount of dust, uh, dust coming from blue skies, red dust. It's, it's very, it happened in 1764 as well. Uh, it happened in many times uh, throughout the historical record. But uh, can you still hear me pretty good? Absolutely. I can hear you. Oh, okay. Okay. It's a, uh, yeah, this is our very first time you are my very first guest in this, this, this is a, as a live, as a live. Now I have had two prior guests, one about 10 months ago and one last week, but these were pre-recorded. This is the very first time that I, cause I got Matt as my, as my IT guy and basically my, my manager, he's, he's, he's taken over a lot of responsibilities in archaics. But this is the first time we've done the live studio and had a had a uh, uh, had a guest. So I had I had to wear an ear earpiece because we can't have any external mics on in here. It'll it'll be an overlap in the sound. So I'm listening to you through this right here, and that's where this glitch comes from every once in a while. The interface of so much equipment we have in here. So I don't want right. to take up too much of your time, but uh, listen, listen. I would like to uh, I, I know you keep your videos 
pretty 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 short. I wanted to introduce my, my my listeners. Most most of them know who you are, but I've seen comments in here where 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 people have been saying that, hey man, I like this guy. I've never heard of him before. I'm gonna go subscribe. So uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing that there were people that were unaware of of, of your material. So I want to tell you guys that uh, there is. There is absolutely crossover here. It does not matter that I'm a simulationist. It does not matter that he is bringing all this data to, to us from a purely scientific perspective. Because I've told you guys many times that I believe that this sentient biogram that we live in will feed us the accurate information that we look for. It doesn't matter that I don't believe anything out there is actually real and that we exist in a hollow field and every bit of this is holographic. And uh, this, this is going to get me to explore more about our electric uh, universe. I'm not really familiar with that theory, but I'm going to start looking into it. I'm always keeping an open mind. But Ben, what would you what would you really what's your core message that you would really want to tell people about basically your 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 message, the direction you're going with your channel and what you really want people to know? Uh, and we'll close out with that. All is being revealed in the end and it's already begun. If you have the eyes to see, it doesn't matter whether you choose to focus on archaeology, whether you choose to focus on religion whether you choose to focus on physics. Everything's telling the same story right now. Uh, if you just look around and you see how people are interacting with one another and how the people in charge of this planet are pushing us in certain directions, it's all telling the same story. And it is going to lead to something, if not exactly the same, something very similar to what you describe on your channel. There is something pretty terrible that happens to this planet every 6,000 years, and it's about to happen again. And we are moving very close, uh, closer and closer by the day, closer by the day. This is what we talk about every single day at the YouTube channel, Suspicious Observers. It's, uh, and as you said, there's a lot of crossover here, not just in the in the viewers, but in the subject I matter. Will, I will definitely put your link. Oh, I'll definitely put your link in the in, in the description box in the pinned comment. And and uh, uh, I know a lot of people in the next 24 hours will be watching this video. But I also know that you're a man of hope because I've heard you say it over and over. And one thing we both believe is that no matter what happens, there are always survivors. There are always whole communities that are relatively untouched while the rest of the world goes through chaos. And uh, it's basically a frame of mind to be prepared and, and, to, and to understand that you can be one of those survivors too. Absolutely. It is. It's not only possible, it is incumbent upon all of us to do everything we possibly can to make sure we are one of those people. And that involves remaining positive, not letting the gravity of all of this take over you and steal your time, your focus, your energy, and staying informed. You know, you want to be the most positive person you can be throughout this. You want to have your eyes open and never let fear take over you. That's about uh, that's about the long and short of it right there. Be beautifully said. I want to thank you moderators for joining us. I want to thank Ben Davidson for coming on. And uh, guys, you got to break free or die trying. And we'll have him on again if, he, if he's willing uh, in the near future. Uh, go, to, go to Suspicious Observers YouTube channel and check out his other comment and subscribe because he's putting out daily reports. Yeah, he puts out more videos than me, guys. But we'll see you next time. And Ben, thank you for joining us. Thank you, sir. Let's go.